We're going to start things off with Edmund Kemper. Yes, one of America's most notorious serial killers is eligible for parole this year. This guy has been labeled a naturally born killer. Not only does he stand at six foot nine, weighing in at 250 pounds, but he also has a very high IQ. Mix that with a troubled childhood and a propensity to violence and it's quite the dangerous concoction. He took the lives of his grandparents when he was just 15. About 10 years later, he killed his mother. Between May 1972 to April 1973, he took the lives of eight women. He would lure women into his car, drive them out to secluded locations, and then smother and suffocate them. He'd then bring the bodies back to his home where he'd them. Kemper ended up receiving eight consecutive life sentences for his crimes, but again, his next parole hearing is coming up this year. Now, I mean, it's very, very unlikely that anything will come of it. He's been denied parole at every other hearing pretty much immediately, or has even chosen to waive his right to a hearing himself. Next up, we have Robert Picton, who recently became eligible for day parole and will be eligible for full parole in 2027, 25 years after his original arrest date. He hasn't had his hearing yet, but the families of his victims have already come out saying that Robert Picton has no right to walk the earth after what he did. And yeah, you know what? I cannot with the sentencing that this guy was given. He received one life sentence. One. Are you kidding? He killed at least 26 women. However, he claims it was 49 and actually complained to an undercover officer that he never got his even 50. He said he was angry, furious, and disappointed with himself that he never got the full 5-0, his words, and now he's eligible for parole? Like what? What happened to consecutive life sentences or life without parole? It's honestly just insane. Why are they even talks about this? If you don't know who Robert Picton is, he's a British Columbia serial killer who was active from the 90s to the early 2000s. He's often referred to as the pig farm killer because his MO included violating his victims before taking their lives and running their bodies through a wood chipper on his farm before feeding the remains to his pigs. I really don't understand how any judge in their right mind would or even could approve parole in this case. The crimes were just so gruesome and heinous. If anything, I feel like we should be adding time to his sentence, not taking it away. Next on the list, we have Paul Bernardo. Now, this name may not be super familiar to those outside of Canada, but this guy is one of the creepiest, most despicable criminals in Canadian history. And his latest parole hearing just happened in February. So where do I start with this guy? He's a serial killer who would also his female victims and his former wife, Carla Homoka, would often assist in his crimes. They earned the nickname the Ken and Barbie Killers, and one of their victims was Carla's very own sister. Um, I remember when I first heard about the details of this case in law class in high school, I had this uncomfortable, just weird feeling for the rest of the day, possibly even a couple days after. I had this feeling like, man, who can I trust? Could I, can I ever really know someone? It's incredibly disturbing how different these two's outward appearance and reputation was compared to the heinous things they were doing in secret until, of course, they were caught. Well, Bernardo has had a number of parole hearings. He insists that he's changed and that he's no longer a threat to the public, but thankfully he's been denied every time. But then again, Carla, God, she was, she was set free in 2005, so honestly, I, I wouldn't put it past them to let this guy go. Next up, we have Mark David Chapman, also known as the man who killed the Beatles, but more specifically, John Lennon, peace activist and co-songwriter, co-lead vocalist and rhythm guitarist of the Beatles. Of course, on the evening of December 8th of 1980, John Lennon was returning to his hotel when all of a sudden he heard someone shout his name. When Lennon turned around, Chapman pulled out a handheld weapon and fired four projectiles into Lennon. Two entered the left side of his back, which traveled through the left side of his chest and his left lung. One exited his body and the other became lodged in his neck. The other two bullets hit Lennon in his left shoulder. John made it to the hospital, but he was pronounced dead soon after. It was a terrible day in history that brought the world together in grief and mourning. John Lennon was loved, and people were devastated at the loss. When Chapman was asked why he did it, he said that he wanted the world to know his name, but provided no other explanation. While he is eligible for parole, he has also been denied parole on 12 separate occasions, so... 
I doubt he'll get it. Next on the list, we have Oscar Pistorius. Oscar Pistorius is known as the Blade Runner for his achievements in track and field, despite having both legs amputated as a child. Competed in the 2012 Olympics in London, but just six months later, he took the life of his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp. On the early morning of February 14th, 2013, Pistorius killed his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp, with a firearm firing at her through a locked bathroom door in his home in Pretoria, South Africa. He claimed that he mistook her for an intruder and fired in self-defense, but the prosecution argued that it was premeditated. He ended up being convicted and with a maximum sentence of 15 years, but he was just released in January. His conditions being monitoring until his sentence expires and therapy sessions. Next we have Susan Smith, who is despicable. After killing her two sons, she was charged with life in prison, with the possibility of parole after 30 years. And guess what? It's been 30 years. On October 5th, back in 1994, Smith had called police officers to report a carjacking. Not only that, but Susan claimed that her two sons were in the car when it was stolen. Smith went on television and pleaded for their safe return, but she was full of it. Susan had killed her sons because she had secretly fallen in love with a man who didn't want children, and she believed that doing so would solve her relationship problems. When police discovered her car, it was clear that it had been delivered deliberately rolled into a lake with her sons inside. Smith's lawyer tried to plead mental insanity, but the argument didn't stick. In response to the idea of Susan Smith being approved for parole, one of her family members was quoted saying, I don't think she's got a snowball's chance in hell. Good. So luckily this guy's uh, parole was just recently revoked, but the story is pretty insane. So in 2000, Kenneth McKay met a woman named Crystal Paskeman at a bar in Saskatoon. He offered to give her a ride home that night, but she never made it home. Instead, McKay drove her to a secluded area her and took her life. Then he set her remains on fire behind his truck. Infuriatingly, he was granted day parole in 2023. Prison officials weren't happy about this, warning that there was a high chance he'd re-offend. And guess what happened? He started stalking a female coworker just three months after being released. Luckily, he didn't get to carry out whatever plan he had before being arrested. Next up, we have Jeremy Wade Vochkovic, who just 22 years ago committed a violent crime that ended the life of a woman in Maple Ridge, British Columbia, named Colleen Findlay. Vochkovic came into contact with a woman while trespassing on her property. He beat her, bound her, and then set her and her home on fire before fleeing the scene. The court saw his actions as deliberate and methodical, and despite the fact that Vochkovic previously a day parole he received in 2022, and despite the fact that a psychiatric assessment expressed grave concern about the level of risk that he posed to the public, he's been given a 60-day unescorted absence from prison so that he may participate in a substance abuse treatment program at a residential facility in Vancouver Island. While he does have to return to the treatment facility nightly and is not allowed to consume or possess alcohol or illicit substances, it is still absolutely crazy to me that he has been allowed to leave prison at all. This next guy has to be one of the most despicable human beings alive today. Luis Gravito. This Colombian killer was nicknamed La Bestia or The Beast and the name really fits. Between 1992 to 1999, this guy took the lives of over 193 young people. Very young, mostly males, and a lot of them lived on the street. It's very likely there's a much higher death toll on this guy's hands. Authorities have said it may be closer to 300. It's just never been confirmed. Not only did this evil prick take the lives of his victims, but he'd violate and torment them first. He would often pose as a priest or a monk in order to gain his victim's trust and lure them to their deaths. Police recovered a suitcase of his that contained journals detailing his crimes as well as tally marks of his victims. It's incredibly sickening and the fact that there were even discussions of this guy receiving parole recently should be a crime. He was originally sentenced to 1,853 years in prison but Columbia law changed and maximum prison sentences were reduced to 40 years. And because Gravito assisted police in recovering the bodies of his victims, his sentence was further reduced to 22 years. He was eligible for parole just recently, but thankfully 
was not released. And to finish us off today, we have a man who is not up for parole, but actually received it back in 1973. And this is a perfect example of why this list is so absolutely terrifying. So in June of 1956, Richard Marquette was arrested for killing and dismembering Joan Ray Cottle. He then scattered her body parts around the city of Oregon to be discovered by police. He was given a life sentence for his crimes, but received full parole after just 12 years. 12 years, the police and the courts had found him to be polite and non-argumentative. And so even though he had taken the life of someone in a horrific fashion, Marquette was allowed to walk in 1973 after spending just 12 years in prison. Just 27 months later, in 1975, Marquette killed and dismembered 35-year-old Betty Lucille Wilson before dismembering her body and dumping her remains in a marsh. When he was arrested, he admitted that he had in fact killed two women since his release and led police to remains of the second victim. He's now serving his second life sentence in the Salem State Penitentiary and he is no longer eligible for parole. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Jason Barnum. Jason Barnum, also known as Eyeball due to his tattooed right eye, is a figure who has gained notoriety for his life of crime and distinctive appearance. Born in Alaska, Barnum's life took a dark turn as he succumbed to a struggle with addiction and criminal activities. In 2012, Barnum's life of crime culminated in a series of events that would land him in a maximum security prison. He was involved in a string of burglaries car thefts, and a shooting incident with the police that left an officer injured. His actions during this crime spree demonstrated a dangerous disregard for human life and the law. During his court proceedings, the judge, while acknowledging Barnum's difficult upbringing and struggles with addiction, sentenced him to 22 years in prison for his crimes. In our number 8 spot today, we have Richard Lee McNair. Richard Lee McNair is a name that has become synonymous with cunning escapes and audacious evasion. Convicted for killering and burglary in the 80s, McNair's story took a turn for the extraordinary when he demonstrated a knack for escaping prison. Not once, but three times. His most infamous escape was from a maximum security prison in Louisiana in 2006. In a plot that seemed straight out of a Hollywood movie, McNair slipped out of the prison work detail by mailing himself out of the prison in a crate. Once outside, he managed to evade capture for over a year, leading authorities on a nationwide manhunt. McNair's ability to charm and deceive, coupled with his physical fitness, made him a formidable fugitive. His escapes and subsequent recaptures were widely covered in the media, earning him a reputation as a real-life escape artist. Finally captured in Canada in 2007, McNair is now held in the Supermax prison ADX Florence in Colorado. His story serves as a chilling reminder of the lengths some prisoners will go to to regain their freedom. Richard Lee McNair is undoubtedly a figure you pray never escapes again. In our number 7 spot today, we have Terry Nichols. Terry Nichols is a name that sends chills down the spine of anyone familiar with the horrific Oklahoma City bombing. Nichols, along with his accomplice Timothy McVeigh, orchestrated one of the deadliest acts of domestic terror in U.S. history. On April 19, 1995, a truck exploded outside the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, killing 168 people and injuring hundreds more. Nichols, a former army buddy of McVeigh's, was deeply involved in the planning and preparation of the attack. His anti-government sentiments and extremist beliefs fueled his participation in this act of terror. Following the attack, Nichols was quickly apprehended and brought to justice. In a trial that gripped the nation, Nichols was convicted of conspiracy conspiracy to use a weapon of mass destruction, as well as other charges relating to the seriousness of his crimes. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole and is currently held in the ADX Florence Maximum Security Prison in Colorado, the same one we just talked about. In our number 5 spot today, we have Dennis Rader. Dennis Rader is more widely recognized by his chilling moniker BTK, an abbreviation which disturbingly describes his preferred method of killing. Rader's reign of terror spanned over 17 years in Wichita, Kansas, a time during which he took a perverse pleasure in his horrific acts, savoring the terror he instilled in the hearts of residents. Raider wasn't merely a man who committed heinous crimes, he was a sadist who reveled in his victims' suffering and the dread he inspired. His chilling letters to the police where he arrogantly flaunted his crimes added an extra layer of psychological terror to his spree. The letters served as a chilling reminder of his presence, keeping the community in a 
constant state of fear and uncertainty. These communications revealed a deeply disturbed mind, one that was not just content with the physical act of his horrific crimes, but also sought to manipulate and terrorize an entire community. Raider's pleasure in his cruel actions, his taunting letters, and the psychological torment he subjected Wichita to make the thought of this man walking free a very unsettling prospect, and one that will probably never come true, thankfully. In our number four spot today, we have Cleophas Prince Jr. In the shadowy realm of San Diego's suburban streets lurked a menacing phantom during the 1990s. Cleophas Prince Jr., at the time known as the Claremont Killer, turned the 90s into a real life horror show. Over nine dreadful months, he embarked on a relentless hunt, marking women as his prey in this seemingly serene Claremont neighborhood. To do this, he would either break into their homes when they least expected it, or sweet talk them into some quiet, out of the way spot. During his reign of terror, while the local news was all over it, the rest of the world hardly blinked. During this time, the stage of national and international press was captivated by other monstrous players such as Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy, which casted a horrific shadow that eclipsed the terrifying exploits of Cleophas. Thankfully, however, in September 1990, thanks to some top-notch detective work and breakthroughs in forensic science, they finally pinned the tail on the donkey. Cleophas Prince Jr., Mr. Claremont Killer himself, got nabbed. The courts threw the book at him, and now he is chilling behind bars for the rest of his days. No parole. No second chances. In our number two spot today, we have Charles Ng. Charles Ng is a name that will send chills down the spine, and he was a key player in the reign of terror that unfolded in the 1980s. Alongside his equally terrifying accomplice, Leonard Lake, Ng played a significant role in a series of crimes that remain etched into the annals of criminal history for their sheer depravity and cruelty. The grim saga began when Ng and Lake joined forces to unleash a wave of horror that would haunt their victims and the public alike. Their modus operandi was chilling. Unsuspecting individuals would be lured into their grasp only to be subjected to unimaginable torture, their final moments filled with fear and agony. What made their reign of terror even more horrifying was the duo's penchant for recording their despicable acts. These videos served as a chilling testament to their inhumanity, a grotesque spectacle of their victims suffering under their hands. Ig's role in these crimes was not that of a mere spectator, he was a very active participant, his cold-blooded nature making him a figure of dread. This, combined with his seeming indifference to the pain and suffering of his victims, made him one of the most feared inmates in the prison system. His heinous acts have left a dark stain on his name, making Charles Ng a prisoner that many pray to never see free again. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have David Berkowitz. David Berkowitz, a figure shrouded in infamy and widely recognized by his chilling moniker, the Son of Sam. He struck fear into the heart of New York City in the late 1970s. His name became synonymous with a wave of terror that swept through the city as he embarked on a series of shootings that left the public in a state of constant fear and uncertainty. Berkowitz's crimes were not random acts of violence. They were methodically planned and executed with a chilling precision that left the authorities baffled and the public on edge. Each attack added to the growing panic, creating an atmosphere of dread that permeated the city. But it wasn't just his crimes that made Berkowitz a figure of terror, his claims of demonic possession added a layer of horror to his already frightening persona. These claims, whether true or the product of a deranged mind, painted a picture of a man under the influence of dark forces, making him an even more unsettling figure. The combination of his heinous crimes, alleged demonic possession, and erratic behavior made him a prisoner that one would fervently pray never walks free again. Next up at number 9, Andre Thomas. Early on in life, Andre was unfortunately very badly abused by his mother and began to experience crushing auditory hallucinations at the age of 10. Then in 1999, while in grade 9, he met Laura, who soon became pregnant and brought Andre Jr. into the world later that year. Now with a son, Andre decided to drop out of high school and get a job to support his family. And by the age of 18, he and Laura finally married. The marriage, however, was short lived. 
lived, as Laura quickly caught on to the realities of his mental health issues and separated from Andre four months later. Tragically, however, the separation took a devastating toll on Andre's not yet diagnosed condition, which began convincing him that Laura was Jezebel and Andre Jr. was the Antichrist, and that he had to kill them. Finally, in March of 2004, Andre broke into her apartment and killed the entire family, each with a separate blade, as he claimed he did not want to contaminate their blood and allow the demons inside of them to live. After the incident, he attempted to take his own life, however, when that didn't go to plan, he removed one of his eyes instead. Eventually, after a long trial, he was sentenced to death for his crimes, until three years later when he removed his remaining eye and ingested it. While his sentence did not change a Officially, this incident catapulted Andre to be relocated to a psych ward as he was eventually seen as not adequately fit to be executed. Coming in at number 8, The Icebox Killer On June 2, 1991, 23 year old Denise attended a concert in LA and began making her way home to Orange County around 2 am. However, the next morning, when her parents, who she lived with, woke to find she wasn't there, they called police to make sure she hadn't been in an accident or hurt somehow. But all that was found was Denise's car on the side of a freeway with a drained battery. And for three years, no one had any clue where she was. That was until July of 1994, when a woman arrived at the house of a man named John Famorello to purchase some paint. While there, she saw what appeared to be a very old rental car in her driveway, and after getting a strange feeling about him, she reached out to authorities who determined the car was stolen. Still not connecting the two incidents, a police officer arrived on site to speak to John about the stolen vehicle. But when he arrived, he noticed an electrical cord running to a freezer from the back of the truck. Initially believing he was running some kind of drug lab, the deputy reached out to a locksmith to open the back of the truck. But to his horror, the body of a young, beaten, and tortured woman was inside, who was later determined to be the missing woman, Denise Huber. And tragically, after investigating the property, it became evident she had likely not been his only victim. John was convicted and sentenced to death in 1997 and remains locked up in California awaiting his fate. Next up at number 5, BTK. To the public and his community, he was a totally normal, polite, and well-mannered man. Raider was an active member of his church and was actually elected president of the church council and even volunteered as a Cub Scout leader. He had a wife and kids who would describe him as a totally average and nice guy. Guy. But Raider had a dark secret that would soon change everything. Despite his outward persona, he was actually a truly disturbed man and was into some pretty terrifying things in the bedroom that eventually leaked their way into his crimes. To start off, I'll give you a hint. BTK is an abbreviation that stands for Bind, Torture, Kill. And it was disturbing things along those lines that he liked to do to, as he put it, trapped and helpless women. But if a woman wasn't available, he would take pictures of himself in women's clothing, wearing a mask of a woman's face, and bind himself as he seemed to enjoy living out a fantasy as as his own victims. Between 1974 to 1991, Dennis Rader killed 10 women in Wichita, Kansas, and was known to send taunting letters to the authorities and media describing his crimes in gruesome detail. There was then a strange hiatus in his crimes for about 10 years, but thankfully this creep was arrested in 2005 and is currently serving 10 consecutive life sentences, one for each woman he killed. Coming in at number 4, George Emile Banks. Despite having a previous criminal record for an armed offense, Banks managed to get a job as a correctional officer in 1980. However, in 1982, Banks began worrying coworkers after he kept saying things like a race war would soon consume the world and that he wanted to protect his sons and daughters from the torment and agony of racism. Then, after a conflict with a supervisor, he was put on extended leave from the prison and ordered to be examined for mental health issues. Not long after his mandated leave from work, Banks, having consumed massive amounts of 
drugs and alcohol, tragically killed 13 people, nine of which were his own family members, three former in-laws, and one bystander. Unbeknownst to Banks, his former brother-in-law was able to survive by hiding in the closet and called police to identify the attacker as Banks. Eventually, police were able to track him down at a friend's house, and after a four-hour standoff, they were able to draw him out. During the trial, Banks explained his crimes by saying he did not want his offspring to be victimized in a race war, as he had suffered from racism much of his life as a biracial man. This explanation, however, did not sway the jury, and he was convicted to life in prison where he remains to this day. Coming in at number three, Joseph Fritzl. One of the most heartbreaking cases I have ever read about is the case of Joseph Fritzl. Born in 1935 in Austria, at 21 he married a girl named Rosemary and the pair had a family of seven together. Now, he was a very abusive man to everyone in his family, but especially Elizabeth. However, the peak of his cruelty began when Elizabeth was 18 and he lured her into the basement where he trapped her for the next 24 years. In those 24 years, he her constantly, and during her imprisonment, she gave birth to seven people. Of course, over the years, many were concerned about Elizabeth's disappearance, but Fritzl would lie and say that she ran off to join a cult, and that he had no clue where she was. One day, after one of Elizabeth's offspring was ill, she managed to convince him to take her to the hospital, and once they arrived, police were on site to detain them. After making sure she would never be forced to see her father again, Elizabeth told a authorities everything that her father ever did to her and her little ones, and Fritzl was sentenced to life for his crimes. Starting off our list in our number 10 spot, we have Vicki Don Jackson. Vicki was a woman who worked as a nurse for a number of years. She first got her nursing license in 1989, but it wasn't until the 2000s when things took a seriously dark turn. Between December of 2000 and February of 2001, the hospital that Vicki was working for recorded a number of deaths that was unusual. It was a higher amount. Most of these patients were in the age range of 60 to 100 years old, and of course people just chalked this up to the advanced age of most of these patients, but a rumor began to spread that someone just might be responsible. After this, the hospital's administrator noticed that a vial of a drug called Mivacron had gone missing. You might see where I'm going with this. As it turns out, the person responsible was Nurse Vicky, and she had at least 10 patients whose lives she took by giving them too much of this missing drug. It was a muscle relaxant. Take in that this is 10 people between December and February. That is an unbelievable amount of people in a remarkably short amount of time. You might be wondering why she took these lives, and apparently she did it when she found these people rude or, quote, too demanding. In our number nine spot today, we have Daniel Perez, also known as Lou Castro. Daniel led a cult that was located on a 20 acre property in a rural area just north of Wichita. He convinced his followers that he had magical powers, and he told them all that he was a centuries-old angel who needed to commit some horrific crimes in order to stay alive. These crimes would have certainly been more than enough to throw him on this list, but he of course couldn't just stop at committing one type of crime, he had to make sure he really stole the show on just being the worst. Basically, he had the really clever idea to use his followers' life insurance policies to live a lavish lifestyle, like as if no one would think that's weird or suspicious. While some of these life insurance policies were collected through regular means, of course that kind of greed only leads to to evil things, which of course means that he ended up taking one of his followers' lives so that he could collect the cash. It is thought that he also contributed to the deaths of some of the other people's life insurance policies he cashed in on, but unfortunately there was never any evidence that would be able to substantiate that claim. Despite this, however, on April 21st, 2010, authorities were able to arrest Daniel, and he was charged with 28 felonies. In February of 2015, he was convicted on all counts and received a sentence of 80 years in jail, where he remains. In our number 8 spot today, we have Chester Turner. Chester is an American serial killer who, on April 30th, 2007, was convicted of taking the lives of 11 women in the Los Angeles area, and on June 19th, 2014, he was convicted of four more that they were able to tie back to him. He has been referred to by prosecutors as one of the most prolific serial killers 
exists in the city's history, and if you know Los Angeles' history, that says a lot. In his original trial that led to his conviction, Chester was sentenced to death, but out of the following one in 2014, he also received an additional death sentence. In the end, like with a lot of these kinds of stories, DNA came to save the day and help authorities find out who was committing these horrible, horrible crimes. In our number 7 spot today, we have Michael Bear Carson and Susan Carson. This couple is not one that anyone would want to encounter. The stories of these two come from the 80s. They were married, and on the outside, they appeared like just a couple of harmless hippies. We all know not to judge a book by its cover, though. In the end, they would go on to become known as the San Francisco Witch Killers. Didn't know San Francisco had so many witches running around. Basically, together, the pair took the lives of three separate people between 1981 and 1983. They started off by killing their roommate, who Susan claimed was a witch, and said that she was stealing her, quote, health, power, and beauty. They next killed one guy that they worked on a farm with because they said he was a demon, and the final person they took the life of unfortunately picked up the pair as they were hitchhiking, and they took his life because they claimed that he was a, quote, black witch, whatever that means. Essentially, they were just committing crimes against people that they claimed to be witches. The pair were each tried and convicted for each separate crime and are both serving sentences of 75 years to life, and of course, neither of them have shown any kind of remorse for what they've done. In our number 6 spot today, we have Samuel Dietman. Samuel is just one half of the pair known as the Serial Shooters. He, along with a man named Dale, were actively committing these crimes between May of 2005 and August of 2006, and basically they were arsonists who would randomly set fire to objects, but they would also drive around and commit random acts of violence, taking people's lives. In the end, a series of tips is what led investigators to identify the perpetrators of these horrible crimes, in particular one from a friend of Samuel who explained that Sam had actually confessed to some of the killings one night while drinking. In Dale's trial, he was sentenced to death six times and his brother, who was later found out to have assisted in some of the crimes, was sentenced to 25 years. Samuel was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Dale ended up taking his own life while on death row, which is why this point mainly focuses on Samuel, who remains in prison. In our number 5 spot today, we have Keith Hunter Jesperson, also known as the Happy Face Killer. After the body of his first victim was found, Keith had someone else actually claim to be responsible for his crime. You would think that this would have been his ideal scenario, but that was not the case. He wanted to be known for his crimes. So to help himself get media attention, he drew a smiley face on a bathroom wall hundreds of miles away from his crime scene, and here he left an anonymous letter where he confessed to the crime and provided proof. He didn't end up receiving a reply, so he decided to write more letters to the media and to the authorities, each signed with a smiley face. In the end, Keith was initially caught after he became the prime suspect in the death of his girlfriend at the time. Previously, his victims had been people that he had no connection to, so this was truly the mistake the authorities needed to catch him. Keith then admitted to his crimes, and while he has formally been linked to eight deaths, he has confessed to somewhere around 185. Keith was tried and sentenced to life without parole for his heinous crimes, and he remains in prison at Oregon State Penitentiary. In our number two spot today, we have Sean Great. Sean is a serial killer who committed a series of crimes from 2006 until he was apprehended in 2016. Throughout his decade of criminal activity, it is thought that he took the lives of at least five people. In September 2016, Sean was arrested and later indicted for two killings, as well as kidnapping and harming a woman whose 911 call actually led to his arrest. At the same time, in another county next door, he was also being charged with two other deaths, as well as another one from all the way back in 2006. This final count from all of those years ago was actually an unsolved Jane Doe case who had been unidentified for 12 years. When Sean confessed to this crime, he wasn't even sure who she was, he just said that he believed her name was Dana. On May 7th, 2018, Sean was convicted on two of the counts, and on March 1st, 2019, he pleaded guilty to two of the others, and on September 11th, 2019, he pleaded guilty to an additional count. In the end, he was sentenced to death and has remained on death row since that final plea and sentencing and he is currently scheduled to be executed in 2025. In a very bittersweet turn of events, in June of 2019, that Jane Doe victim was finally able to be identified through the DNA Doe Project, and she was identified as 23-year-old Dana Nicole Lowry from Minden, Louisiana. It definitely can't bring her back, but there is a lot of comfort in knowing that her family finally received some answers. In our number one spot today, we have Glenn Stewart Godwin. In 1980, Glenn was working in California and wasn't really living a life of 
organized crime, so it's pretty surprising that in this year, he and his roommate decided to make a plan to rob someone they knew who was once a friend of theirs. Of course, things go awry and it turns into a botched robbery, and Glenn ends up taking the life of the person they were robbing. They then tried to blow up the crime scene to get rid of any evidence, but of course that didn't work and also just made them look even more insane. Both Glenn and his roommate were both tried and convicted for the crimes in 1983. This is not where the story ends. In 1987, Glenn tried to escape prison and failed, and this landed him at a higher security prison. At this new prison, he attempted escape again, and this time, he was actually successful. He fled to Mexico, where he tried, unsuccessfully, to be a part of the illegal drug trade. He was arrested again and sentenced in Mexico, and this is when American authorities began the process of getting him extradited. During this process, Glenn decided that it would be a brilliant idea to take the life of an inmate who was a member of the Mexican drug cartel, which very obviously slowed the process of extradition. This gave him time to plan another escape, which he did in 1991. And since then, he's been on the run. Number 10. Richard Ramirez. Okay, here we go, right off the hop. Richard, who is also known as the Night Stalker, he was a serial killer who terrorized the streets of LA back in the 80s. He was known for, you know, invading homes, which left him initially being dubbed as the walk-in killer, but he had another signature that was concerning to many people as well, especially during the height of the satanic panic. This is not good. Richard was known for leaving behind different satanic messages at the scene of his crimes. Because of his satanic signature, after he left his first pentagram at the scene of a crime, authorities became him worried that he was just a Charles Manson copycat, but instead he was, you know, his own kind of monster. Nice. It is said that he would leave more pentagrams behind while also telling his victims to swear to Satan instead of swearing to God. During his court appearances, he would hold up a pentagram and after pleading not guilty, he said, hail Satan. Yep, uh, it would appear otherwise, my friend. Okay. Number nine, John D. John D was a scientist from the mid 1500s. Okay, we're going way back for this next one. In Elizabethan fashion, the scientist also fancied the occult, because I guess they were all bored back then. He worked a alongside Edward Kelly. Now at the time, John Dee was working in the court of Queen Elizabeth I. To show you what kind of role he played in, you know, a functioning society, John Dee casted an astrological chart in order to determine when the queen should be crowned. Yeah, he was one of those guys. So cut to 1581, both John Dee and Edward Kelly both claimed to communicate to the other side via crystal balls. Eventually the town wasn't cool with this guy speaking to angels or demons, cause yeah, surprise, surprise, not everyone's on board with that, would you know? So the queen sent him to Manchester. She's like, get out of here. But when he arrived, he was warden. He was warden of Manchester Collegiate Church. John Dee refused to be part of exorcisms, but a table with an odd demonic bird mark found afterwards. So he's been busy, it seems. This mark is said to be from the hoof of the devil when John Dee summoned him. The British Museum still has John's demonic obsidian mirror if you want to take a peek yourself and see, uh, you know, how those curls are doing. Number eight, Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey is one of the most well-known serial killers with his crimes taking place from 1978 all the way to 1991. His crimes are far too brutal to really get into but he's known for taking the lives of 17 different people. Now at his trial, not only did he plead not guilty, but his attorney had some interesting words for the court. His attorney stated that his bloody pattern had caused him to believe that he was the devil, which was intended to, you know, bolster his insanity plea. His attorney said that he became enamored, overwhelmed, even caught up in the character from the movie The Exorcist 3. Yeah, said character was Satan. Yeah, if you're thinking, oh, which one? Is it the neighbor? No, the devil. Not only was Jeffrey found to be sane and ended up being sentenced to multiple life sentences in prison, of course, but not too long after his sentence started, he was killed by a fellow inmate. Number six, H.H. H. Holmes. He's considered America's first serial killer and he was especially gruesome. H.H. H. went to medical school and shortly after finishing, he began killing people in order to steal their property. He built himself a huge, horrifying house that he'd built to include things like secret passages, trap doors, soundproof rooms, doors that lock from the outside with gas jets on the inside. He even had a kiln to cremate the bodies. Not only would he get close to women to take control their finances and then, you know, ultimately kill them, but he would also require his employees to take out life insurance policies that named him as the beneficiary. It isn't exactly known how many victims he had, but it's thought to be somewhere over 200. He was sentenced to death when he was finally caught, and it's said before his execution, he famously said, I was born with the very devil inside me. Number five. Sam Little. Known for being one of the worst serial killers in history, Sam Little has confessed to taking the lives of more than 90 people, and while authorities have only been able to, you know, connect him to 30 officially, they say they have no reason to doubt the other ones are probably true as well. Sam was able to continue this horrible path for so many years because of the fact that he committed these crimes in different states and different countries, which made it, of course, difficult to connect his crimes to one another. He was, he was too fast. He changed his name a lot, and that's, that's obviously hard. In an interview with an investigator named Sergeant LeBlanc, they discussed religious beliefs, and they 
spoke about the nature of sin. Here comes the devil stuff, you know? You're like, okay, when does it get to the devil stuff? Now, during the interview, of course, Sam stated he had no fear of God and even said that God made him this way. So why should he ask for forgiveness? He said that God knew everything he did and he also allegedly told a few select people that he believed that he himself was the devil. Number four. Ronald DeFeo. Moving on to another case that inspired more Hollywood horror. If you've seen the Amity Bill horror, in some ways this should ring some sad bells. Although the movie adds a lot of paranormal aspects that was not present in reality. Or was it? No one's really sure. That's the main argument nowadays. Ronald was charged and convicted of taking the lives of his entire family. Last year he passed away in jail at the age of 69. After his passing, certain letters that he had written were released. Before his death, Ronald had given many different accounts of what happened on that fateful night, which has made it now impossible for anyone to follow or really understand how it happened. Ronald himself stated there was no demon. You know who the demon is. It's me. I am the demon. So does this mean he wasn't in fact possessed or he was, is at the time? <sighs> Somebody saying they're a demon certainly doesn't help their case. I don't know. Number two, Arnie Johnston. This one's a little different because this person didn't claim to be from hell, but rather they had hell inside of them when they committed their atrocious crime and it like wasn't their fault. This trial was well known previously, but it's become of course more widely spread as it's the trial in the newest Conjuring movie. And in 1981, Arnie Cheyenne Johnston killed 40-year-old Alan Bono in what appeared to have been just a simple argument gone wrong quickly and got more twisted and confusing. When it came to his defense for the crime, the devil made him do it. Yeah, just like the third installment in the Conjuring franchise, the title, Devil Made Me Do It, is in direct relation. That was his excuse. This was the first time in history now that possession had been used in an American courtroom as defense. Prior to this, Arnie had been at the scene of about three exorcisms that had occurred before this, you know, alleged possession. And this is why there's so many people that believe him. At the end of the day, the jury in the trial decided to convict him of manslaughter. And finally, number one, Niccolo Paganini. We'll finish off this demonic list with the late Italian composer Niccolo Paganini. This man knew how to play the violin, let me tell you that. Apparently, a little too well, some would say. The 18th century icon brought romance to violin technique. He studied with many violinists over his life, but what really explains his skill is the fact that his mother made a deal with the devil when the lad was only six years old. Niccolo leaned into these accusations and actually used it so people wouldn't mess with him anymore. They would be afraid of the violin composer, you know? They're like, oh, we don't talk to him. He's like the Doctor Strange violin guy. He fights with music. Thinking back now, I'm like, yeah, I get that. Guy needed to invent a romance via a violin. But what if he was? What if he was working for the devil the whole time? The musician passed away at age 36 and there wasn't a single church that would take him. It's pretty rude, but also it's understandable. We we'll use your music at the funeral, but we're not gonna bury you. Number eight, Pazuzu Algarod. In North Carolina, a man going by the name of Pazuzu Algarod was arrested after it was discovered he had been burying bodies of his victims. He had taken on the name Pazuzu in reference to the demon from The Exorcist, and had even undergone some strange body modification, making his tongue forked and sharpening his teeth. If that's already not weird enough for you, the man who was at the property when the bodies were discovered had a lot to say about Algarod. He said that the man was possessed by demons and that they would take over his body about once a month, usually around a full moon. He described it as being very serpentine and said that the man's eyes would get glazy, saying it was like the inner part of the man would fade away. And he also said that Algarod would sacrifice animals once a month. The interior of the home was also terrifying as the walls were apparently covered in graffiti and dark symbols and the building was deemed unsafe for human life. Number 7. Pamela Fernet In Norfolk, Virginia, two police officers officers were called to the scene after receiving reports of a man screaming and yelling in the street, and it didn't end when they got there. The man apparently swore at the police and assaulted them, even biting one of the officers on the hand. Pretty strange, but I'm sure we've all bitten someone at some point, right? right? Well, it gets just a little bit weirder. A woman named Pamela Fernet is apparently the wife of the man who had attacked the officers and had apparently been begging them not to hurt him despite his actions. She said that her husband hadn't been in his right mind because he had been possessed by a demon. Pamela said that she had even managed to catch the demon on camera and knew that it had possessed her husband, saying, I caught it on camera, a demon. It really was, so I figured that's what got him. Unfortunately, I couldn't really find much more information on this 
other than the original report, so we may never know just what Pamela actually saw that day. Number 6. Tommy Smith In February of 2015, a young man named Tommy Smith saw a car that he wanted, and he wanted it bad. Instead of, say, saving up money and purchasing it, he instead decided to steal the keys from the 65-year-old man driving the car. But when the man wouldn't give in, Smith got angry, attacking him with a weapon so aggressively that he even managed to snap it in half. Fortunately, the elderly man was able to survive but suffered serious physical and mental damage as a result. When Smith went on trial for the attack, he said that he had started suffering from hallucinations a few weeks before the crime took place and had actually been possessed by a demon at the time of the attack. Similar to Arnie Johnson, the court didn't want to hear it and noted the young man's history of schizophrenia. He ended up being charged but didn't go to jail, instead being sent to a mental hospital until they saw fit for him to be released. Number 3. Cody Lott Over the years, men have been known to do crazy things over unrequited love, and this story is especially tragic. Two young women were walking down a footpath in September of 2016 when they were approached by a man in a car. That man was named Cody Lott. He then attacked both the girls with a weapon, only one of them surviving the event. At his trial that took place two years later in 2018, Lott claimed that he had actually spoken with the devil, and that the devil had even helped him to plan the attack, saying it was due to one of the girls having a boyfriend and his own frustration over not having been able to find a romantic partner. Due to these claims, he was found mentally unfit to stand trial and sent to the maximum security unit of a Texas mental hospital. After he was released and was able to stand trial, he was sentenced to life in prison. Oddly, his parents then sued the state of Wichita to get the weapon used in the crime back, saying it had been stolen from their apartment, so I guess it was pretty important to them. Number 2. Louis Zambrano on September 10th, 2015, in Queens, New York, a body was discovered. It was the body of Angie Escobar, who had apparently died after being attacked with a pair of scissors, reportedly having been there for about four days before she was found. Police were quick to find a suspect, arresting the woman's short-term boyfriend, Louis Zambrano, who had attempted to run away to Virginia. When put on trial, he claimed that he had two reasons for the attack. One, demonic possession, and number two, trust issues. One of these things is not like the other. Everyone who heard his declaration was disgusted, both the victim's family and the judge calling him out on his ridiculous claim, believing he was clearly using it as a poor excuse. He was convicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison, also receiving an extra three years for an unrelated burglary charge. And I wonder if that one was the devil's fault too. Number 1. Michael Taylor A lot of people think that exorcisms are a thing of the past, but they're most definitely not. The Archdiocese of Indianapolis is reportedly receiving around 1,700 exorcism requests in the year of 2018 alone. Back in 1974, an exorcism took place in England, the possessed man being Michael Taylor. He had joined a church and allegedly started having an affair with the congregation leader, Marie Robinson. During the time they spent together, Taylor went from a seemingly happy man to a more angry and irritable one, until eventually the two were caught naked together and Taylor blamed it on an evil presence or demon that was within him. A vicar was called in to perform an exorcism on him, and in October of that year, they reportedly expelled a whopping 40 demons from his body. Despite them believing that there were still three evil demons inside him, they let him go on his way. And only a few years later, he was found covered in blood, and he said it was the blood of Satan himself. Well, it was actually the blood of his wife, him having taken her life. Taylor was put on trial, but was found not guilty due to reason of insanity. Starting off this countdown, we have Richard Matt. Matt's career as a criminal started off when he was young. He was involved in robberies, kidnappings, and then eventually murder. The first murder he committed was of his former boss. He then fled to Mexico to avoid being caught. While there, he murdered a second man while attempting to rob him. In 2007, he was convicted for the murders and began serving a 25 year to life sentence. But guess what? 2015, he actually escaped the facility with a fellow inmate, and they spent 20 days on the run before getting re caught. And apparently, he has a history of jailbreaks. 
So I don't know why they just didn't pay closer attention to him. In the end, this was his final escape since he was caught and killed by border patrol while trying to flee to Canada. In our ninth spot, we have the dating game killer. This dude gets his name because while police were looking for him, he appeared on TV for an episode of the dating game in 1978. He did this in the midst of his murder spree. In fact, the dater on the show actually chose him, but when they met afterwards, she said that she got a bad feeling around him and they never actually went on a date, which that was a close call for her. Because during his appearance on the show, he had already murdered at least five women. His date would have probably been his next victim. This killer would often toy with his victims. He would strangle them until they lost consciousness, then he would revive them, and then repeat this process several times before taking their lives. In the end, he was convicted of murdering five women, but police think that his kill count is much, much higher. In our eighth spot, we have the razor blade. This story comes from a prisoner who was locked away in a Texas prison. The prisoner told the story of a fellow inmate who everyone feared. It was this woman who would violently lash out on her fellow inmates. One time she even put a razor blade in a bar of soap and would use it to cut up other prisoners. When the guards found them, there was blood everywhere. So yeah, I can see why people fear her. I wouldn't want to get on her bad side, let alone even look at her. Moving on to number seven, we have Ronnie McPeters. One of the scariest inmates in the world is said to be Ronnie McPeters. Ronnie was sent to jail for the murder of a 27 year old woman in 1984. The woman, Linda Marie Baltazar, was running errands when Ronnie came up to her window panhandling. She shoot him away and he left, but then he ended up coming back, this time armed. He then shot her five times. As a result, he was arrested and sent to Fresno jail. But his bad behavior never stopped. While in jail, he would set fires, attack other prisoners, and even sometimes would, you know, smear his feces on the walls and floors and sometimes all over his body. Now, he was actually put on death row for his crimes, but he was deemed, and I quote, too insane to be executed. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the inmate from hell. So this story comes from a nurse who worked at a prison. She shared the story of the scariest inmate that she has ever encountered. This inmate would go around biting officers in their arms and shoulders. He would headbutt them as well as even punch them directly in the face. He has broken people's bones and even ripped out chunks of flesh off of them with his teeth. Yeah, that must have been terrifying to see. Like, what the heck? Moving on to number four, we have Pascal Payet. Pascal Payet is a French criminal who was sent to jail for committing a murder during a robbery in 1997. But he is famous for his daring prison escapes. In 2001, this dude managed to escape prison using a hijacked helicopter. But he didn't perform the stunt just once. No, no, he escaped twice. So obviously, he was caught and then sent back to jail. Then in 2007, he did it again. It only took him five minutes. Within that time frame, four masked men hijacked a helicopter and took the pilot hostage. They then landed on the roof of the prison and used some device to open the doors and get Pascal out of his cell. Like I said, they were in and out within five minutes. Two days after this escape, an arrest warrant was issued against him. Nowadays, he is never kept at the same prison for more than six months, and he is placed in solitary confinement where he is under high surveillance. They don't want him escaping for a third time. In our third spot, we have Damien Folks. All right, folks, let's talk about Damien Folks. Dude, see what I did there? Anyways, this guy, don't get me started. So this guy was serving a life in term in jail for armed robbery. While in jail, he attacked a number of prisoners. He strangled killer Colin Hatch with strips of bedding and also slashed the throat of Soham murderer Ian Huntley. And this is what he had to say to that. He said, I hope I killed him. I've been planning it for weeks. Now, Ian Huntley did survive, but he had a seven inch wound that just missed his juggler vein. But that's why Damien is considered incredibly dangerous. In our second spot, we have Mark Hobson. Mark Hobson went on a killing spree in North Yorkshire, England in 2004. As a result, he took the lives of four people. But he was also involved in a nationwide manhunt, which involved more than 500 police officers and 12 police forces all looking for him. During that time, he was considered Britain's most wanted man. And this is another dude that is not afraid to get violent with others. In September of 2005, he poured a bucket of boiling water over a fellow killer. And on a number of other occasions, he has attacked other prisoners. 
As a result, he is another prisoner who is kept under close surveillance at all times. And in our number one spot today, we have Robert Maudsley. Robert Maudsley has actually been named Britain's most dangerous prisoner. Now you might be wondering, Lindsay, why is that? Well, oh boy, let me tell you. In 1977, Maudsley and his fellow inmates held another prisoner hostage. They tortured him for nine hours before cracking his head open and killing him. And rumor has it that he even ate some of the prisoner's brain. As a result, he was deemed the real life Hannibal Lecter. A couple months later, he murdered two other inmates, then casually told the prison officer that during the next roll call, he would be too short. As a result, he's actually kept in an isolated glass cell so guards can see what he's up to at all times. They don't want another hostage situation to occur ever again. Number 9. Eric R. Rudolph Resourceful and resilient, Eric R. Rudolph quickly got on America's most wanted list. Why? Well, during 1996 to 1998, Eric detonated bombs four times in Atlanta and Birmingham, taking the lives of two people and injuring thousands. A five year manhunt ensued. He was finally caught in May 2003 after he was found rummaging through a dumpster. Later, it was revealed how intense his survival skills were. For five Five years, Eric foraged off the lands and survived off of buried barrels of grain and soy. He learned the schedules of when produce was going to be thrown out at grocery stores and stole what he could where it wouldn't be noticed. His motivation behind the bombings was a compilation of radical anti gay, anti abortion, and anti government. The list goes on. He didn't get along with other people, and when he confessed to his crimes, he showed no remorse. But when he was taken away to go to prison, authorities report that the man had tears in his eyes, knowing he was utterly defeated. What can I say, man? And your actions brought you to where you are now, so sorry about it. Sorry, not sorry. Number eight, Robert P. Hansen. The man the FBI was afraid of, and he was right under their noses. Joining them for lunch in the cafe, grabbing coffee with them, laughing at the cooler. But all the while, Robert P. Hansen was a mole. On February 18th, 2001, Robert was arrested and charged with committing espionage on behalf of intelligence services for the former Soviet Union and their successors. He was caught red handed placing a package containing highly classified information at a park in Vienna, Virginia, for his Russian handlers. When the FBI searched his apartment, it became apparent his payment was in cash and diamonds with the value of over $600,000. Hansen handed over dozens of delicate files, including FBI counterintelligence investigative techniques, sources, methods, operations. He exposed the FBI's secret investigation of Felix Block, a foreign service officer for espionage. He pled guilty to 15 accounts of espionage on July 6, 2001 and was sentenced to prison without the possibility of parole. He is considered the most dangerous spy in the FBI history. God knows what he said. Number six, Zacharias Musawi. The ADX prison is intended as a holding cell to teach prisoners proper conduct before they are sent to penitentiaries. However, some are so bad that they are never released for fear they might inspire new crimes if allowed to communicate to those outside the walls. Zacharias is one of them. He is currently serving out six life sentences for assisting the hijackers who carried out the, you guessed it, the 9 11 attacks on the World Trade Center. Musawi was placed on a watch list in 1999 when he started interacting with Islamist extremists. He could have prevented the attacks entirely, however he lied to the FBI about the Al Qaeda and their plans to attack the US. He was even supposed to pilot a plane into the White House. He was arrested in August 2001 and went on trial in 2006. Throughout the trial he praised the Al Qaeda and was removed for several outbursts. A very different tone to the note he wrote recently in 2020 renouncing Al Qaeda and appealed to younger Muslims to be wary of their deceptive ways. I really do hope he has genuinely released those ideals, however he did do it in an attempt to relax his sentence. As recently as 2018, he was still referring to himself as a natural born terrorist. So, needless to say, I don't see things relaxing anytime soon. Number five, the marathon bomber, Jahar Sarnayev. Speaking of the ADX prison, there is yet another permanent resident behind its walls. Jahar Sarnayev is responsible for the 2013 Boston Marathon bombing, which took the lives of three people and injured 250 people in the large crowd. This event shook the world, and I remember when it happened. I remember checking my phone repeatedly in order to figure out what's happening and follow with updates, and I'm sure a lot of you do too. He and his brother Tamerlane used two pressure cookers packed with explosives and shrapnel. His brother was shot during a police chase while Jahar was taken into custody. He was 19 when he committed the crime and 21 when he was finally tried. The trial consisted of heartbreaking testimonies from families of the injured and the dead. The death penalty was disbanded in Boston for decades, but it was considered for this case as it was a federal case. He was instead given his life sentence to be served out in solitary confinement 
environment with no opportunities to communicate with the outside world and that is probably how it's going to remain for the rest of his life. Wow, so young. Number four, the Nathari killers. The Nathari crimes came to light on December 29th, 2006, after eight skeletal remains of young bodies were found in the drain of a house in Nathari, Noida. The owner of the house and the businessman, Mohinder Singh Pander, and the domestic help, Surinder Kohli, were arrested. Soon after they were found, even more bodies turned up. The village had been making noise about the disappearances for a while before anything was done, but now the Nathari killers remain some of the most horrific people behind bars. Over 16 young people fell victim to kidnapping, vicious bodily violations and death, which believed to have occurred between 2005 to 2006. Both men have been found guilty and the death penalty is in discussion, though has been delayed. Some believe that there is money involved in the case that may result in an unfair result, but considering the severity of the case, release is not really on the table. I'm not going to lie, it was hard to get a straight story on this, there is a lot of convoluted details across the articles I could find, so if you have more info you want to share, drop it down below. Number three, Larry Hoover. This dude is so powerful that he was continuing to run his operation while serving out a 200 year sentence for murder. Larry Hoover was, slash is, I suppose, the chairman of the notorious Gangster Disciples Gang. He was convicted two decades ago of continuing to run his empire behind bars. Hoover, now 70, is serving out six life sentences at the Supermax Federal Prison in Florence, Colorado, a facility that holds the worst of the worst. Terrorists, mobsters, anyone who'd be a danger to anyone from the outside. It is said to be the most secure in the country. He established the gang in Chicago in the 1960s and has recently decided to try and take some of them down. The indictment accused seven state and national leaders of the gangster disciples of racketeering conspiracy, drug trafficking, witness intimidation, and multiple murders, including the 2018 death of a 65 year old ranking member of the gang on Chicago's south side. Beware if you've ever crossed Larry Hoover because even behind bars, you can't stop him. And last but not least, Monstrous Maudsley. Whew, when I started reading about this guy, I literally had to step away from my desk. It, ugh, there were some images I just didn't want to read, but here we are. Meet the man so dangerous that he is now kept in a below ground glass box in complete isolation. Not only did he take lives outside of prison, but inside of it, he was the man everyone feared. The point that made me turn away was what he did with a spoon, which dubbed him the nickname of Hannibal the Cannibal. Robert Maudsley has been locked away in a glass box Box, just like the infamous villain for over 40 years. He was sentenced to life in prison after taking the lives of four people. His crimes were so violent, the cops nicknamed him Blue because that was the color of the first victim. But his crimes did not end behind bars. He brutalized and took the lives of abusers of young victims behind bars in vicious and terrifying ways, just like you would predict people would do in prison. He was so volatile and like laissez faire about it that the only thing the prison thought to do about it was build him his own cage. He is allowed one hour of exercise a day. His childhood was riddled with abuse and he would often take most of it to protect his siblings. Mm -hmm. 